Adam, what a beautiful introduction. I'm so happy to see so many old friends and I almost want to apologize for intruding upon this social event with some historian thoughts, but that is the reason that we're, we're all here. But I just see so many really important old friends and I feel so much love and, and such vivid memories for, for all of you. And I, I hope later in 2021, if this pandemic ever ends, it feels like it is going to end, that I can get down there in, in person and say all these things to, to you um, one at a time or maybe in a, in a group the way we so often were in groups. You use the word experiential and everything we did was experiential for those, those wonderful years, six years from 2000 to 2006. Um, I really look back on it as kind of the acme of my, my life. And I'm not just using that word because acme was my supermarket of choice in, in Chestertown. It really was just a, it, the, the best of life. It was a time of um, professional growth. I had never directed anything. And it was so exciting to come in at the beginning of this really big idea, CV Star Center with funding from outside of the college, but with a clear idea from, from Dr. Toll about what it would be. And then to really sort of see it grow month by month uh, in, into something quite important and special in the in the landscape of history nationwide that um, celebrated the place where it was. And, and that was a joy always to figure out how interesting Chestertown was. And the last talk I, I attended from the CV Star Center was Adam's talk on the Eastern Shore in the Civil War. And it was as, as always with Adam's talks, it was incredible and left me really thinking a lot about how lucky I was to, to be in, in Chestertown. And we were there at a time when, I mean, it was a big deal to occupy the Custom House, pretty far off the, the campus of Washington College. We were also there in a really exciting time of um, our own history in Chestertown, where the African-American community was beginning to to claim the Sumner post and to just make its own history known to the rest of Chestertown. And I was so proud to mainly listen. I, I, I think that's what I mostly did was I listened to the stories about how interesting black history was in Chestertown. And as we started the Sumner Post project, that was thrilling. And then we even had some global aspirations. We got a grant from the State Department to host summer programs for two years in a row with young Islamic students from South Asia. And that, that was some of the best teaching I've ever done in my life with some of the best students I've ever, I've ever taught. So it was just all magical. And I mean, it's clear how fun it was. I'm already thinking about my favorite Rush album, so I can talk about that with Donald McCall after, after the talk, but, but it was serious too. And we, we found the best historians in, in America and always could get them to come to Chestertown. We started the George Washington Book Prize, which is going strong almost 20 years later. And out of all of the historians in America, I don't think there was a more talented one than Adam Goodhart. And about, I, I don't remember making a lot of decisions. I remember just sort of loving every day of life, but I remember one decision was whom to choose for the first writer in residence. We got a little grant around 2003. As I recall, Jay Griswold was, was behind that grant. And um, I'd always had an intellectual crush on Adam Goodhart. I'd actually never met him, believe it or not, although we had been in some similar circles, but I, I had never met him. And he had a Washington College decal on the secondhand car that he was he was driving. At least he claimed to have, that's, he's told me that story and I, and I believed it. And um, 
And it was the beginning of a very important friendship in my life. And I, I just don't think the Star Center could be in, in better hands than, than with Adam. And I'm so grateful for my own feeling of connection to the center and to the college and to Chestertown and to everyone through Adam. So it's, it, you know, it's just always magical. Um, and I know I'm supposed to talk about my book and I will, but I'm, I'm really hoping to talk to all of you. And if you don't get a question in tonight, just email me and we can do it, do it that way. So, so um, Casey, if you don't mind starting the PowerPoint, this will be, you know, maybe 10 minutes, I hope. Um, so that, yeah, that's the title of my book. And then the next one, this was my world in Chestertown. This was where Mary and Freddie and I lived, 103 North Queen Street. I, I had the best commute in America. I had a one block walking commute, took about one minute to get to the custom house. I also walked the other direction to get my newspapers at, um, with, from Miss, Miss Anna uh, every, every morning. And that, that was about the extent of my commuting. So I, I, I had arranged the perfect work situation. Um, okay, next slide. In that house, I had this book from my own childhood. I read it around fourth grade and it had a very powerful impact on me, including the fact that it was profusely illustrated. And I was always hoping to get back to Lincoln, but I wasn't quite sure how to. I, I taught a course on Lincoln when I was a professor at Washington College and that took me a long way toward Lincoln, but I I needed some sharpening of, of vision to get me all the way there. Okay, so this book rocked my world when it, it came out. It rocked my world with the force of a, of a Rush song. Um, it was a, a joy to see it emerge and I, I was present at the creation. Um, Adam and I have helped each other in so many ways, we don't even consider it helping because it's so, so natural. But in about two, well, no, in exactly 2010, I was talking with some editors at the New York Times where Adam had worked previously, and they wanted to start an online series about American history and specifically about the Civil War. Back then, that was a pretty radical idea to, to put history in an online part of a newspaper. Nobody even knew what the online New York Times was because we all read the printed paper, like the one I got it from Miss Anna every morning. And so um, the disunion feature of the New York Times began and it ran for five years. And I told them at that first meeting, I have a friend who's writing a beautiful book about the beginning of the Civil War. And they called him and Adam became the, the lead writer of the series and wrote many dozens of articles probably, you know, about a hundred articles for the Disunion series. And that helped to promote his book when it came out in 2011. But it also just gave hope and inspiration to everyone out there who wanted to write history in a new way because it combined the best of narrative writing with impeccable research. And it's just a beautiful book. And if you haven't read it, I just want to say now, Almost 10 years later, uh, this should be a, a book party for 1861 also. And everything about this book blew me away, including the tasteful daguerreotypes at the beginning of every chapter and the aesthetic of the book, but especially the, the literary tone. And I hoped, even though I'm older than Adam by a fair amount, I hoped that someday I could maybe shed some of the academic shackles that I felt from my own training and write a little bit more like a novelist the way Adam, Adam wrote so easily. So, okay, Casey. So after the book came out, Adam wrote a piece in the National Geographic to support the book. It was about Lincoln's funeral train in 1865 after he'd been killed in the, in the slow, sad passage through America. And he invited me to accompany him uh, on a trip to Illinois and back from Illinois to do some of the research for that piece. So I didn't hesitate and uh, we had a wonderful trip, which I think the feeling you can capture in the next photograph, Casey. Um, it was just so much fun. We, we dodged cops. We stayed up all night. 
we um, we talked about the Civil War. Pretty got pretty crazy, and um, somewhere around that time, I was thinking a lot about the opposite of the the funeral train, the train trip in from from Springfield, Illinois, to Washington, which Adam actually mentions and writes about beautifully in 1861. But I had a feeling. I could really put a lot on that trip. I could do a very deep social history of America, looking at every city that Lincoln went through on that train on the way in and tell a kind of epic story of a, of a politician at his apotheosis and how interesting the country was as it was shifting from the 80 year period or so from George Washington's presidency to Lincoln's to something very new beginning. Um, okay, so this is a photograph of the day Lincoln became president, March 4th, 1861, in front of the incomplete Capitol. And you can see a lot of people there. Can't see Lincoln, but he's he's there. And um, this is where most books about Lincoln as president begin. You know, it's, here's his first day on the job. For me, this was the end. I wanted to get to this point and show how incredibly difficult it was for Lincoln to even make it to what we think of as the normal beginning of his presidency. It was an, a Herculean challenge to get through this violent, angry country and even make it to those steps. So I, I was looking at it from the opposite point of view. Uh, here's a, a, the the manuscript copy of his first inaugural address. And you can see he was writing things pretty close to the day of the speech. And the famous quote about the better angels of our nature is, is written in, in, in pen at the bottom. So you see a speech coming together still uh, pretty haphazardly. He's been given some suggestions from William Seward, his secretary of state, but things were really up in the air. And I wanted to capture that feeling in, in the book. So here's a picture of the Capitol about a year earlier, and you see this um, toxic canal, the city canal that flowed in front of it, pretty near the site of the, the assault on the Capitol on January 6th as they came up the mall. This would be in the middle of the mall now. And as I wrote the story, it, it, you know, it, it dawned on me more slowly. I didn't quite know what I was doing until I got more deeply into it. But um, in a way, the villain, if Lincoln is the hero, and he is, the villain was this toxic city of pestilence and lobbying and protection of slavery that had been here, been the capital since 1800 and had blocked progressive reforms ever since that time. And so Lincoln has to get into a structure of government that is a kind of fortress against him. And that added to the difficulty of, of the trip. So here he is on the, or just after he was nominated, two days after his nomination, surprise nomination in Chicago, um, looking really incredibly young. We have, I think in our minds, different ideas about how old Abraham Lincoln actually was. He looks quite old at the end of his life, but uh, uh, in this year, he was 51 years old, really quite young. What's that, 26, 27 years younger than, than President Biden? And I like this particular image, which is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, because it shows how photographs were were rare enough that they, they were looked at as almost as if they were paintings with frames around them. This is a photo I learned about from Adam um, in a disunion column. I think Adam discovered it, but he can, he can tell us afterwards, but it's uh, an amazing photo. The Capitol is just, I don't know whether you'd say it's coming together or falling apart. It was unclear. It was a little bit of both. They're like pieces of columns and masonry and huge rocks all around the grounds. It, nothing like the way it looks. Well, now it doesn't look so good either because there's fencing all around it to keep people away. But um, Adam found this incredible photo of a column being raised for the Capitol on the day Lincoln was elected. Lincoln was elected on November 6, 1860. 
So this is a couple of weeks after his election and you might see something happening on his face. He's got a, the beginnings of the Lincoln beard and Adam writes about what beards symbolize to young Americans in, in his book. And I too wrote about it, but I, I, I almost interpreted it as armor that he's, it's, so Adam writes very persuasively that it was a message to young people that included a message of sympathy for liberalism. Walt Whitman has a beard on the frontispiece of Leaves of Grass and there's some kind of soft collar stuff going on with Lincoln, which is like what Whitman did. Um, there were also young European liberals who, who often had beards, but I also just thought he's getting ready for an ordeal. He's growing some protective armor on his face for the trip he's got to take. So one of the heroes of my book is a woman, and I'm so happy to have a, a, a woman in a Civil War story because there are so few of them. Dorothea Dix was a mental health advocate from, she was actually born in Maine, but she grew up in Massachusetts. And she did so much good work all around the country that she was very well regarded in the South as well as the North. And in a trip through the South in the fall of 1860, she picks up hard intelligence that, uh, Lincoln is going to be killed on his way into Washington, and she knows exactly where it will happen. So this is a map of the main train line from Philadelphia to um, Wil through Wilmington, Baltimore, and then ultimately to Washington. And you can see a big chunk of the Eastern Shore on this map. And she had f identified the spots. They were there were would-be assassins walking underneath train bridges. There are a lot of, as you know, anyone who lives in Maryland, there are a lot of duck blinds and little creeks and the railroad, especially between um, Haver de Grace and Baltimore goes over a lot of little creeks like Gunpowder Creek. I bet a lot of you know them better, better than I do. But over small bridges that could easily be um, dynamited or people could be standing there with, with guns if the train could be stopped. And um, she went to the head of this railroad who was a man named Samuel Felton, his offices were in Philadelphia and she told him all about the plot and he took action. And I believe that the confluence of Dorothea Dix and this alert CEO of a railroad saved Lincoln's life in 1861. So the man on the left is Alan Pinkerton. That's Lincoln in the middle, of course. Um, Alan Pinkerton with the Napoleon pose of the hand in the jacket um, was hired by the head of that railroad. He was a railroad detective based in Chicago. He was an immigrant from Scotland. Immigrants are important always in the story of Lincoln. He, he liked them and, and vice versa. Um, and Pinkerton is hired immediately after the Dorothea Dix meeting to come east and infiltrate the assassins. And that meant going into Baltimore, into restaurants, oyster bars, taverns, and impersonating Lincoln-hating Southerners or, or Marylanders. Let's, let's be honest, Marylanders were, were pretty Southern in 1861. And he did a brilliant job. And he got all the information that they needed to, to protect Lincoln. One of his agents he brought with him and there really should be a movie about her. Actually, there was a story in the Washington Post two days ago about her. I still don't know if it's Warren or Warney, but this brilliant woman, Kate Warney, was a young widow in Chicago who went to Alan Pinkerton and said, I think women can be detectives as well as men and maybe even more so. And he didn't wanna hire her at first and she was very persistent and she became one of his star agents and she was brilliant at impersonating Southerners and she came to Baltimore and she was so good at her job that Pinkerton sent her to warn Lincoln as he's coming in on the train, he sent Kate Warney to tell him that you, you cannot come through Baltimore in the middle of the day or you will be killed. So she's an unsung hero of American history. So the trip begins on February 11th, a week ago today, in 1861, Lincoln gives this beautiful farewell speech to his hometown of Springfield. And you know, it's 
kind of like how I feel about Chestertown, that he was saying, I have lived among you. you. You know me and I know you. And we are here to help each other. And he gave this just extraordinary speech about what he was about to do, going on a difficult trip to save the American experiment and how hard it would be and how it was harder than any chore, any challenge any president had faced since George Washington. Um, in saying goodbye, he mentioned a few very personal facts about his life in Springfield, including the fact that uh, one of his children was buried in, in Springfield. And people began to cry as he spoke. He began to cry, which he didn't do very often. And there were no notes, but there were reporters there and they transcribed the short speech and wrote it down. And it was the beginning of a kind of miracle that began to happen and never stopped happening, which is this obscure Illinois politician who no one knew very much about, turned out to be the greatest giver of speeches in, in American history. And, and I, I feel safe to say of all time because I don't think anyone will ever top him but he was able to reach into his emotional register as well as just talk about the issues in a very clear way. And that short speech of farewell was transcribed by the reporters and sent all around the country by telegraph. And it did a great deal of good for someone who had the world, the weight of the world on his shoulders. And just by talking about how much he loved his town, he related to America. And that really helped him when he was, he'd, he hadn't even won 40% of the vote. And he began to climb up in the estimation of America from that moment on. So every city was fantastic. I, I just loved these cities. I, I, I tried to describe them as if they were cities on the European tour, like Florence and and. Paris. So Cleveland is wonderful. This is, you, you can't, I, I'm sorry, the, the image isn't very good, but you can see Lincoln leaving, leaning over a balcony in downtown Cleveland in front of a huge crowd of about 50,000 people. And it was like that everywhere he went. In New York, he, st he stood above a, a, port a, a, a pediment of a, of a hotel, the Astor House Hotel in lower Manhattan. And uh, Walt Whitman was there and heard him speaking and this this was what Lincoln looked like the first time Whitman heard Lincoln and, and Whitman spent the rest of his life talking about this moment. So something in Lincoln was so different from the run of the mill politician that people were immediately affected and never stopped remembering the one time they saw Abraham Lincoln. This is the only photograph from the trip. It's in Philadelphia, Adams hometown. It's at, at Independence Hall. And he stood in front of a large flag. You can't really see him very closely, but he's there. He's near the far to the right star on the flag. And he, he raised with a rope in a kind of um, physical way, which was exciting to people. He, you know, he pulled the rope like a sailor and lifted up the flag uh, high in the sky over Independence Hall. And that was another great, I don't want to say soundbite, but it was, you know, a kind of media friendly moment that helped Lincoln look more presidential on the way into Washington. So this was the city that was the hardest place for him to come through. He, his friends called it the seat of danger. And the problem with Baltimore was that there were three different train stations. I talk a lot about the railroad in the book. And he had to transfer from one station to another. And that meant going in a horse and carriage through town, which meant that anyone could surround the horse and carriage and shoot guns at him or, or jump in and stab him. And it's, I mean, we still are, you know, we're sifting through the evidence even all these years later, but apparently the Baltimore police force was understaffed that day. There was a ship in the harbor waiting to take the assassins away. Had he come through in daylight the next day, what he ends up doing because of the warning is coming through at four in the morning. So he, he makes it safely. This is uh, the President Street Station where he came into. Uh, it was built around 1850. This is a photo from 1923. It's still there. It's the Civil War Museum in Baltimore. And it's an important location. It's where all trains went to Philadelphia from Baltimore, but um, 
It's important for another moment in American history relating to the next slide. In 1838, Frederick Douglass from the Eastern shore uh, put on a sailor costume and boarded a northbound train at the President Street station. So Lincoln is in a way reversing the journey of Frederick Douglass, but even though he's the incoming president of the United States, he's like Douglas, terrified that someone will know his real identity. He's coming through on this train in an ordinary passenger compartment at four in the morning with Kate Warney, Alan Pinkerton, and his, his old friend Ward Lamon, and that's it. So the president was not so far from the fugitive slave. This is um, Alan Pinkerton's Brass Knuckles, which are now the possession of, the, of Ford's Theater in Washington. And this is the last stop. He makes it to the what was then the Washington Depot of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, just down the hill from the Capitol, even closer than Union Station is today. Union Station is pretty close, but this was on New Jersey Avenue um, near Pennsylvania Avenue. And um, there's now a carillon. Some of you who know Washington well may know there's a very odd tall structure that is a carillon of bells in honor of Ohio Senator Robert Byrd that is very near the place where this train station was. And so he made it. And you can see the uphill slope of Capitol Hill going up to, Cap to the Capitol. This is a later photograph of later in the 19th century. Um, so that was my story. And I thought it would be a travelogue, but as I wrote it, it just became freighted with so many other thoughts. I was writing it, I mean, I, I'm embarrassed how long it took me. It took me nine years, but I did feel a kind of um, danger, a danger that was threatening our democracy. I don't wanna to get too political in a, in a talk that I hope is bipartisan, but I felt that Lincoln's survival on this train trip kind of spoke to me because I was worried about the survival of American democracy in 2017, 18, 19, and, and 20. And Adam knows that I also became very interested in Homer's Odyssey. And I began to, as if there wasn't enough weight on the book already to think a lot about what it meant in ancient Greek literature when a man was on a long trip that felt like he was trying to save his country against incredible odds, including monsters and mythological creatures. And it often felt like that facing Lincoln, but like the Odyssey, every time Lincoln spoke, the clouds dissipated, the d disappeared a bit and, and um, the path became clearer in the act of speaking and claiming his own destiny, Abraham Lincoln, I think made his path that much wider and, and safer. So why don't I end there? I talked longer than I meant to, and I really do want to hear uh, Adam's questions and, and those from the rest of you. So thank you. Ted, thank you so much. And I know there are going to be a lot of questions, so I don't want to monopolize your time. And I would encourage people who have questions um, to start typing them into the, into the chat. And um, I'll, I'll read folks' questions and ask them um, to Ted. But I did um, want to ask you, Ted, you know, one thing that's really a source of fascination with me, and that I, I feel like your, your work has so many strengths, and um, one is just your beautiful writing, but another is that you bring this special insight to writing about the presidency, and you've done several books on the, on the presidency, uh, ranging from your biography of Martin Van Buren to your book um, on JFK's White House to this one on Lincoln. So you've, um, you, you worked in the Clinton White House yourself. Um, you spent years observing um, modern day presidential power at close hand. How has that informed your understanding of the presidency through history? Well, thank you, Adam. And I'm sorry I talked so long. I see it's 542 and I meant to take about 10 minutes and that's the predicament of the academic is once you get going, you love the sound of your own, your own voice. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to show how complicated and basically impossible a job it is. Lincoln couldn't possibly satisfy everyone with every utterance along the road. He 
he made the South furious. Um, he he also had frustrated a lot of his fellow Republicans who thought he wasn't polished enough to become president. Seward by this point is actually helping him a lot, but a lot of Seward's friends are not that excited about Lincoln. So he's got to deal with snooty Easterners along the route, um, as well as furious Southerners. And a lot of people who just don't know what's coming. There's a terrible feeling of anxiety about what, you know, what will America be with this under experienced newcomer coming in from so far away. And, and um, I mean, my book ends before he becomes the president, but I, I do remember the feeling, which I only had as a, an observer from far away. I was not in meetings where great policy decisions were, were being made, but just the exhaustion of the presidency. I saw Bill Clinton up close and my specific job was this foreign policy speechwriter. So I, I went on these foreign policy um, grueling trips, one to Africa that nearly killed everyone who, who went on it. It was an 11 day trip of a president of the United States, but in surprisingly primitive conditions where electricity often didn't work in places where we were going to and um, a, a large media delegation was growing increasingly furious because they didn't have all of their creature comforts, you know, and just how hard it is to keep this, this idea going of a, of a single human being who is directing the most powerful government on, on earth with immense responsibilities for the, the large country that we are in, but also for global policy, because so many foreign leaders look to the president of the United States. And I just remember feeling like, how can anyone get this job done? And that was a part of this story that appealed to me was the chaos of Lincoln's trip and the nearness of disaster every day brought forth that feeling that we may think we're supremely rational and we may love the founders and we may think checks and balances and all of that, but often this system is running in a way that is surprisingly close to peril. And we saw that again on, on January 6th, I think. Thank you, Ted. And, and, you know, a few minutes ago, you disavowed any intention of making this um, political and about the present, but it's a little bit weaselly of you because you've yeah. been, um, been writing an incredible series of, of op-eds, of essays in the New York Times and the Washington Post over the past um, six months or, or a year that have really um, tied together this exceptional historical moment that we're going through um, to the moment of, of the Civil War and the moment that you write about in your book. So um, I have a feeling that, that others um, on this, in this conversation who have read some of those essays will want to ask you questions about them, which um, I'm looking forward to hearing about. And we have one question already from Kurt Landgraf, the President Emeritus of Washington College, asking, President Biden is facing a broken, divided country. What advice do you think President Lincoln would give to President Biden? It's a great question. Um, I, I think he's been following that advice and he, he actually quoted Lincoln at least once overtly, but I also heard one or two other Lincoln quotes in his inaugural address. He, he quoted him explicitly when he said, um, my heart is, is in it. Something Lincoln said when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm, I'm forgetting the exact quote, but then he also he said, the last full measure of devotion, which is a quote from the Gettysburg Address. Um, and what I think he's been doing, which is Lincolnian, is he has been talking to the whole country. He's not just talking to Democrats. And Lincoln, you know, basically indulged in a legal sophism, which was that there had never been a secession of the South, that Th that was just a quote unquote rebellion of a few people. It didn't really affect the grandeur of the United States. Of, of course, it was a, an extremely serious. It was a new nation that was trying to get going. And Lincoln always pretended that it was just a rebellion. And he kept talking to all of America. And in his second inaugural address, he, he blames American slavery, not Southern slavery for the cause of the Civil War. 
And I think Biden has been talking in a similar way. He's not too sharply partisan, which I think is good. However, he's he is governing sharply. He's proposing this huge stimulus, which is you know a much more democratic me- measure than a Republican one. And he's sending generators out to Texas when the Republicans are hapless and can't can't get anything done. So that's Lincolnian too. I would say it's sort of talk in a way that brings all Americans together, but govern well. Gov- you know, show people what the government can do to help people, and he he is doing that. So I'm, I'm pretty impressed with Joe Biden so far. Thanks, Ted. And um, we have a question. So, of course, um, Lincoln, unlike many people who assume the presidency, um, had not just a, a spouse, but also um, very young children who were joining um, their parents on this um, journey to, to Washington amidst such um, dangerous times. And so we have a question about um, when and how did Mary Lincoln and the children come to Washington? She she was a problem for me in the book, I have to be honest, because she's very difficult, but clearly they deeply love each other also. And so I wanted to convey that. And I tried to, with an anecdote, as she's coming into, as they are both coming into New York, um, she, you know, he never looked at his best. He, he, he didn't pay attention to his personal appearance at all. And coming into New York and there's a huge crowd of, you know, something like a hundred thousand people. And he says, do I look all right? And she says, you'll do Abraham, you'll do. And she kind of smooths his hair. And it's just a nice touching moment between Mary Todd Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln. Um, So they came a day later, the trip started with him alone with his, his entourage, his his young assistants and the army officers who were with him in some press. And she joined him in Indianapolis where he went the first night. And then he went alone that last night through Baltimore with, with just you know the, the two or three people sitting next to him alone in the commuter cabin of a, of a train. Um, so she wasn't there every day of the trip, but she was there for almost all of it. Thanks, Ted. Um, Can I address your Weasley comment, Adam, also? Yeah, yeah. Totally spot on. And, um, but, you know, I, I do want to say I just enjoyed in the experiential way of the CB Star Center, I met a lot of people in Chestertown who were clearly not Democrats and might have looked at Bill Clinton a little bit askance, especially after the scandals of the last couple of years of his administration. And it never troubled any of us in the slightest. We just all loved our country and American history and had great conversations. Um, but, but about my op-eds, I wanna say that we're clearly in some bizarre movie in which we are occupying each other's identities because you're there in my former office. And before the talk, Adam, pulled out something my son Freddie had had drawn and left in the desk, which is still still there. But I'm now a furious writer of op-eds the way you were. And I, I just read this great anecdote in a Lincoln letter. He wrote to some people in Boston who had invited him to come talk about Jefferson. And he said, it's so funny that people in Boston now love Jefferson because you used to dislike him. And it reminds me of a story he actually put in his handwriting a joke about two drunks who got in a fight and they couldn't connect very well as they were punching each other. And they got so confused in the middle of the fight that they actually put on each other's clothes. And I feel like that's a little bit true of you you and me. So now I'm writing op-eds all the time and you're you're there in my, my former office. We have a question um, from Mark Eubel, and um, Mark, I believe, is the um, father of Amy Eubel, and Amy was um, one of the really early um, students involved with the Star Center and um, student um, fellowship recipients and um, went on to a great career as a um, public history educator herself. So it's, it's great to see Mark here, and I think Amy might be here as well. Um, so Mark asks, I was impressed with how many former and future presidents Lincoln met with on the journey. 
would this occur again in our partisan environment? But I wonder if first, Ted, you could just talk about those encounters with former and future presidents. Well, there are a ton. I got sort of fascinated by that. And so in every stop, um, there are future Republican presidents throughout the Midwest because so many came from there. Benjamin Harrison comes from Indiana and James Garfield, who's in 1861 also comes from Ohio. William Howard Taft, who's just a baby, is in Ohio. William McKinley is in Ohio. Um, Millard Fillmore and Grover Cleveland are in Buffalo. Chester A. Arthur is in Albany. Very young Theodore Roosevelt is in New York City. So they're, they're sort of everywhere. And I mean, a lot of America lived near the train tracks and I wanted to convey how important the train was. It was like the lifeblood of information. And that in itself was an important thing to know about America in 1861. Um, and, and I remember Amy Eubel very well and please say hi to her, uh, Mark. She She's wonderful, was a wonderful student and I, just loved my teaching at Washington College. But, um, well, that's part of the problem now is it would be so great to have a meeting with a president there with thoughtful Republicans and Democrats there raising their hand like we're doing tonight and just everyone listening and being respectful. But it isn't that way, as we all know. There's just so much animosity from one side to the other. And there are entirely different bodies of information that people believe and it's hard to have a civil conversation beginning with I mean I, I don't want to get too partisan but it is still strange to me that nobody I mean a lot of the Republican Party will not admit that Joe Biden won a fair election you know that's just who we are as a people we look at the results carefully you win some you lose some we pick the winner and then it's four more years then you run again and it's, it's really hard right now. There's a whole ecosystem of information that doesn't let in the facts. And I, I think that is troubling for our, our country. Oops, you're mute, muted, Adam. Thanks, we've had um, a, a hand raised for a little while from our dear friend and former colleague, um, Donald McCall. And Donald, you can unmute yourself. Okay, Char Charlotte did it for me. I am Charlotte. Say hi, Charlotte. Hi. Okay, now we can be quiet for a sec. Um, Ted, I read your book when I wasn't feeling very well at all in Adam's apartment in about three days before COVID came. I had this wonderful period in Washington and I went home. And I just, I keep dreaming about it and thinking about it and Lincoln was for me, especially as a Canadian boy, just a, you know, a lodestone of, of everything that was good and true. But there was a, I think a phrase, I think echoing Nietzsche in the back of the book, it must have been the, the afterward. And you mentioned words I thought Ted Widmer would never speak. And those words are the twilight of the Republic. Uh, I just am curious where that came from. You're a good reader, Donald. Um, I we try. <laughs> struggled. And Nietzsche's too smart for me. I, I, I threw in a little Ulysses and, and that was enough. And I, Nietzsche would have been too, too heavy. But um, I wrestled a lot with my own depression about where America was going, which wasn't just about Republicans versus Democrats. It was about a mean country. <laughs> country of people who don't listen to each other the way we always did in Chestertown and who foment ridiculous conspiracy theories about child molestation in pizza parlors, you know, just stuff that isn't real. At our best, we are a factual people. You may not like the facts, but you accept them and you just, you know, you work hard for your side to have another chance. And, um, I was depressed about America in 2019, and I had a version of that very sentence, the last sentence that was um, even darker, and it was a, it was about 
the lost moment when Lincoln was trying to save America. I, I can't remember the exact words, but it was about how that moment has come and gone and we'll never get it back again. That America is somewhat over as we understood it. And then Twilight felt better to me because it admitted that there might be some light. It's a word that's in John F. Kennedy's inaugural address. Um, he's talking about the twilight struggle of the Cold War. You know, I read a lot of presidential speeches when I was a speech writer. And so I thought twilight was the word I, I wanted and I'm happy with it. it but I, I you know, I re you're, you're a good reader because you caught me in, in one of the hardest sentences of the entire book. And do I wanna be ridiculously upbeat? I used to be that way. I was just so upbeat in everything I did. Do I wanna be depressing and say, it's, it's all over and I came out somewhere in the middle and I wanted to give young people like Charlotte a feeling that what they decide to do will, will tip the balance. You know, if they wanna make a good country come back, they'll, they'll, it'll come back. Taking things back to the um, 1860s, we have a comment from um, Leslie Raymond about David Hunter, one of the um, people who accompanied Lincoln on the trip. And, and in fact, there were so many um, different people who some of them were already well-known, some of them were um, totally unknown, but would become well-known. But, but that, um, that train um, had some other remarkable passengers besides Lincoln. And I wonder um, if you would talk about any of them. Well, thank you, Leslie. And you know e everything I said about how exciting it was to learn about Chestertown in the Eastern Shore's black history and the Sumner Post. All of that came from Leslie, I, I'm sure. It just was such a pleasure to get to know her and go out to Toad Hall, one of the many incredible homes where our conversation just kept going. You know, we talk about history in the classroom and then we just keep it going outside the classroom. Um, I didn't even know there was a David, hum, David Hunter a USCT post in South Carolina, but it makes sense. He was a Northern officer and, you know, there weren't that many. The, the army was pretty Southern and he and a couple other officers wrote to Lincoln before the trip starting started saying, you have to be really careful, especially coming through Maryland because it's a very Southern place. So Lincoln invited David Hunter to come on the train with him and I didn't find a lot of material about things David Hunter said but my main evidence for what a solid person he was was th this letter that he wrote to Lincoln before the trip started, which th is in the Library of Congress. And so I think it was, it was reaffirming for Lincoln to have these men in blue jacket, you know, in the, in the uniforms of the United States Army. And they're beginning to figure out that they, in fact, are the United States, that the United States, they, they'd when the Mexican war was fought, it was primarily led by Southern officers. And they're figuring out that those guys aren't gonna be around anymore. And they're gonna to have to step up and become a new army of not of the North, but of the United States. And so David Hunter was that kind of person with a, a broad vision. Thank you, Ted. And um, I, we, we've just, I just heard the, the bells of Chestertown um, ringing six o'clock. So I don't wanna um, keep things going too much longer, but um, I think- I can keep going. I, I can stay for the duration if, if people want to. Great, well, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe what I'll do is um, I'll, I'll ask one more question um, and then we'll sort of um, officially declare the event over, but anybody who feels like hanging around um, and just sort of sharing some informal Chit chat is is more than welcome to stick around, sort of in the way that like at the end of a of a Star Center event, um, people just sort of like mill around in the room and and they aren't really ready to go home yet, and they're just kind of chatting with each other and and with the speaker. So so maybe we'll do that um, after after this um, last question, um, and I'll give the question to um, a resident of of Queen Street, neighbor of the Star Center and former neighbor of of yours, Vic Pfeiffer who asks um, how you feel as a historian who by your discipline are devoted to uncovering and analyzing and writing about facts. Um, what are your feelings about the current challenge to facts um, and how do we as a society get past this? And I have to say that for me as well, of, of all of the terrifying um, things about January 
6th, a day that was just so searing, I think, for, for all of us, um, what remains the most chilling to me is just the evidence that it's possible for people to live in completely um, hermetically sealed spheres of reality or, or lack of reality that are that are impervious to um, the basic enlightenment principles yeah. of reason and observation of the world. So I wonder what you have to say. Yeah, that's not democracy. Her hermetically sealed information environments is not democracy. Democracy is, is about learning from people who are not like you, which I would say that was my experience in Chestertown for six years. It was a, a beautiful experience. Um, and a hermetically and sealed, sealed environment is, is not going to be good for our politics. Democracy is about compromise and getting to a temporary position you can all agree on and then trying again a year later. And um, by the way, I think I saw Kitty by on the call and I just wanted to say how exciting it was to have Birch by in our scene in the later years I was there because he was the best of American democracy. He was a Democrat from a pretty Republican state. So now he's very Republican, but we, you know, just always working with his fellow senators to get it through the entire US Senate and um, did an incredible amount of good in his career as a US Senator. Um, so I'm, I'm troubled by that too, Adam. And it, you know, obviously if you could tell from what I was saying, I was upset by Donald Trump. It wasn't a day of his presidency, I, I, I wasn't upset, but I was also very upset by the casualness of our social media monopolies, Facebook being the worst, but Google has its own things to answer for and just um, raking in the money by serving these various information constituencies with all of the information they want to get as riled up as possible. It's almost like giving a, a, a large sugar full filled Coca-Cola to a nine-year-old. You know, it's just, it's, it, it's unethical. And I think we need to think hard about regulating the way information is sent around. We want freedom of expression, obviously, but we don't want just sort of fire hydrants full of lies opening up and, and just, you know, sending all that information every day with the force of a fire hydrant into unprotected people's laptops. And, and so we need to really think hard about how information is regulated because that's part of democracy too, as the founding fathers knew. Thanks, Ted. And um, thank you for such a, such a stimulating um, conversation and, and for introducing um, us to just a little bit of, of your extraordinary book. And um, I want to actually cut and paste into the chat here, um, let's see to encourage everybody to um, go and buy and read your book. I just pasted a link to- Oh, Barnes thank you. Noble, not to Amazon, you will note, but to Barnes and Noble um, so that people can get it. And I, I have a feeling that um, maybe if people even um, mailed you the book with a self-addressed stamped envelope um, that you might send it back to them with an autograph. Oh yeah, let me, I'm gonna type in an address for anyone to do that. That would be great. And I hope very much to come to Chestertown in person in a, in a few months, so. Great. And, but, and um, I also just, the final thing I wanna say is that I hope that um, those of you who are here with us tonight will be joining us in future weeks and not just for the t-shirts, but also for the um, conversation and the, and the learning. Next week, we actually have the only one of these programs that's not at 5 p.m. Um, at 7 p.m. next Thursday, um, an event that's being sponsored with the Cole Gallery at Washington College and with um, the Chesapeake Heartland project that you've heard about. Um, and that is an evening of words and song. And it's members of the Washington College community, members of the broader um, Kent County and Eastern Shore community coming together to share um, some performances around the theme of the Jason Patterson exhibition on the black history of Kent County and Washington College. So that's next week at 7 p.m. The following week, March 4th, we go back to our 5 p.m. slot. And I'm really excited about that event because we have 
um, Neil Gabler, who's one of the most distinguished American biographers and the former recipient of a Star Center Patrick Henry Writing Fellowship. And he has um, published, just published, even newer than, than your book, Ted, um, a new biography of Ted Kennedy and the rise oh, yeah. of American journalism. And so he's going to have fascinating things I know to say both about the Kennedys and about um, contemporary politics and the roots of contemporary liberalism. So we hope you'll join us for those events and um, keep an eye on your mailbox for future ones coming. We're planning to take this series all the way up through the Washington College semester at the beginning of May. And um, please get in touch with any suggestions, comments, thoughts that you might have, requests for future events. Um, we would love to hear from, from any and all of you. Um, I am with that going to actually stop moderating, um, tell everybody that uh, to have a great night um, and you're free to, to go off and, and do your thing, but you're also free to stick around. And if you wanna chat, just unmute yourself and chat away. <laughs>